Uh, well, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's funny that it was unexpected, which uh, segues into the title of this talk. So what happened was I was in St. Petersburg at a conference and I was uh, walking with the organizers back from the restaurant. It was like 12 a.m. in St. Petersburg. And um, we walked down the street at 12 a.m. and you know, I naturally asked, well, is this safe? Are we safe here? What's going on? And they said, ah, yeah, it's safe. It's good. It's totally safe, totally fine. Like, well, how about all those videos I see with, uh, you know, the guys who throw axes at each other? Eh, not, never happened. How about the woman that carries a tree on her back? They say, like, eh, never happened. How about the tank, tank that tank that crosses the street and stuff? Like, nah, nah, it's just like, uh, maybe once. <laughs> no, okay, cool. So, okay, I'm not, this is not, not a joke. It's a story. It's a true story. So, three minutes later, so we walk down the street, and three minutes later, there's a fender bender, like maybe, I don't know, 20 meters from, from us. Sorry, this is America. 66 feet, okay? <laughs> 66 feet from us uh, and a half. So it's like, there's a fender bender and we see in real time, four guys jumping out of one car and three guys jumping from the other car. And without any introductions, they start punching each other in the face. <laughs> this is God's honest truth. They start punching each other in the face like, but you know, that's funny, there's no, it was like choreography. It's like they jump out of the cars and like in a ballet motion, they start, you know, they start hitting each other. Like, how about like get a piece of me, you know, come get a piece of me, all that trash talk, there's no trash talk, <laughs> right? So they just start, it, it was like on a cue, they started punching each other in the face. So now, it turned out, uh, by some, uh, some uh, happenstance, it turns out I was the tallest and the biggest guy in the, you know, there were like two more guys and two women. So it so happened I was the tallest and the biggest guy, so the women hid behind me. And what I said was, don't worry, you're with me. <laughs> what went on in my mind at the time was, Oh my God, they're punching each other in the face. And what I should have said was, young lady, you should know I've never thrown a punch in my life. So if you ever threw a punch at your brother when you're five, you're more qualified than me. And by the way, the 20 pounds I have over the, these two other guys, that's not muscle. So anyhow, so I do recommend visiting St. Petersburg in spite of the story. I think it's a great city. It's actually, it's, you think, it's, okay, what's a, it's a city, right? So it's a nice city somewhere in Europe. So you go there and I, you know, 30 minutes later, so I got this guide and 30 minutes later, I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. So, so much good stuff here. Which brings us to expected. <laughs> All right, so, um, Today we're gonna do a little experiment uh, which would be uh, reinventing uh, exceptions. And uh, this project started, uh, actually let me, uh, let, let's actually discuss exceptions a bit as a means to handle errors and then we're going to get into expected. So uh, most of us, uh, I remember when I learned about try and catch, it was the days when uh, there was syntax coloring for the first time in editors. So I'd be like, I, you type try and it becomes blue. That was amazing, remember? It's like, oh my God, it's blue, this is awesome. I'm gonna put try and catch in every single function I write. So I was very happy with uh, using try and catch. I, I didn't take them critically, right? So then there's uh, all of that, uh, you know, all of the, the ordeals that the C++ community went through to discover its way around exceptions. Right, so most of us don't took them on critically, so here's, uh, you know, try and catch and just use it have a good day and everything. But you know, we don't know what, you know what, what are their goals and how do they compare against alternative means of error handling? What uh, were the intended use cases? You know, how does the semantics support what we want to get done? And what are the consequences, the new setup of, uh, of the world? So most importantly, how do we write code that is a uh, nice exception, uh, you know, uh, compliant if you wish? You know, there's so many uh, means to choose from. Right? Um, well, you know, there's, new, there's a new one too. Yes? 
Herb Sutter's proposal? Uh, raise your hand. I'm not seeing anything, but raise your hand, please, if you heard of it. OK, I, I see nothing, but you know, thank you. Oh, you, you should, if it, this was like 30 years ago and everybody smoked, you'd like, you know, raise your highlight, you know, your, uh, your light there. And anyhow, so essentially, um, what's funny about exceptions and error handling in general is that uh, it's the, the meaning of, an, of an, what's exceptional and what's not depends a lot on the context. The same issue may be a completely expected matter in one setup and something that is completely um, not allowed in another context, right? So we want to learn you once and use many. We want to learn one mechanism and use it many times for error handling in general. We want to minimize what's called soft errors and maximize hard errors. So soft error would be an error that doesn't, doesn't go detected immediately. Right, so it's, uh, what would be an example of a soft error? Please shout. I didn't hear that, but I assume you said dangling pointer. <laughs> did, did that, was it not even close? Okay. <laughs> File not found. Okay, so we have a dangling pointer error, and it's kind of, uh, sometimes the application actually keeps on trudging along, and it kind of almost works, right? So that would be a soft error. And the hard error is that it's detected immediately upon uh, upon it, uh, it's happening. So that's what we're looking for, right? We don't want those metastable states in which essentially all of the guarantees provided by the type system are gone, right? We don't want that. And uh, then uh, essentially we have no guarantee. So it's kind of the application is like really like on, on skids there, right? Not nice. Uh, we, we also want to do things like centralized handling but also local handling. We want everything. And we want to pay nothing for it. This is C++, come on, right? We want to die. Whenever I want local, I want local to be nice. But you know, when I don't care about local, I want centralized to be nice. And uh, you go design that, right? And by the way, I want it cheap, right? So um, these are issues, right? These are kind of difficult, uh, difficult design issues for a programming language. We want to be able to transport from wherever they are happened to wherever the error is handled, however much information we want. For example, if it's an out of memory error, we want to transport four gigabytes of memory. <laughs> that, yeah, thank you, that was a joke, yes. Thanks for laughing, yes, thank you very much. So uh, we want little cost on the normal path, there's gonna be more about this later. And uh, we want to make correct codes e code easy to write and incorrect code difficult to write. So uh, starting with a simple example, which is actually, we live in infamy, A2I. If you Google for A2I, I think the first hit is like, avoid A2I. Why? Because it returns an int. So what, if it return, if it, A2I encounters any error, be it, uh, it doesn't look like an integer, or maybe it's too big of an integer and doesn't fit, it's going to return the most unlikely integer ever, zero. So then you, it returns zero and you're like, aha, uh -huh, this could be a legit zero or it could be an error. So then I gotta check. So then what you do is maybe use a regex, which is like, you know, just like 156 times more complicated than A to Y. So you're better off just re-implementing the goddamn A to Y yourself, <laughs> right? Not nice. And the problem with A to Y is illustrative because A to Y covers all of the values of an int. It's a surjection, they call it. So every int is covered by A2I. There is some, there's a string that represents every int. There's no null int, right? There's no int that doesn't exist, right? With float, there is a float that doesn't exist. It's called not, an M, not a number, right? But with int, we don't have that luxury. So not nice. So what do we do about this kind of stuff, right? Well, there's always Erno, which by the way, A2I is not guaranteed to set. Did you know that? I, I, I read it, so I, I, I gotta be prepared for the stuff so I can make fun of everybody, right? So with Erno, you know, whenever something goes wrong, you set Erno and uh, pray that somebody's gonna check it at some point in uh, the lifetime of the application. Uh, it's going to be fairly general. It's going to minimize soft errors. No, because when was the last time you checked the result of printf? 
It could fail, I mean, come on, right? Invalid file handle and whatever, right? But nobody checks printf. So we want to um, have centralizer handling, which Erno supports nicely because it's centralized. We want to support local handling, which it kind of supports. But we can't transport an arbitrary amount of error. It's just an integer. And essentially, you know the worst of Erno, which is you got to make sure you allocate the values in that integer appropriately so you don't step over the operating system's reserve values and all that nonsense, right? And all the headers and all that stuff. It's a little industry there. You know, I sell Erno values for cheap, right? So not nice. And they're not, you know, Erno is not famous for making correct code easy to write. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's not the best choice. So it, there's a lot of red on that slide is what I'm saying. Well, there would be a special value, um, uh, there would be a special value scenario which is uh, coming along in this nice, uh, I have this fancy thing here. Um, this nice str to long function which takes a pointer to character and a pointer to a pointer to a character which is going to be filled with wherever the conversion stopped. Right? So it's it's filling the it's it's giving information about where the conversion stopped. So then you gotta kind of track back and try to do things and you know figure out what the hell happened and that kind of stuff. It's kind of difficult to distinguish things like there was an overflow versus it wasn't a number. And so it's kind of not nice. And R, R would be the, the radix. So not very cool. Um, so it's not very general. You know, it's, it's, not very, it's not very nice. Uh, let me uh, point out, uh, let me kind of insist a bit on the returning a special int here. Uh, like we have in A2I, it's returning a special value which is zero. Uh, the special value thing would work if you return pointers because there is one pointer that is unlike any other pointer. And that would be, thank you very much, the null pointer. Right, so there's a singular pointer that doesn't point to any value, et cetera, et cetera. So you could actually at the minimum say, well, there's a, there's a singleton, uh, there's a singular value of the pointer and you know, we, we can do that. But for most other values you can't, if it's a date, you can't really return. Actually you could if you really want it, but there's not, it's not general, there's no generality there, right? So it's not gonna minimize softwares and it's not gonna do good centralized handling. It's only good for uh, local handling. So not very nice. So we have this uh, unpleasant situation too. So now let's actually design together a system that would work. And I'm thinking, you know, thinking naively, uh, just, you know, again, like clean the slate, you know, clean, clear up your mind. Take a yoga pose right now, okay? So just think, of how would I design A2I if I had like complete freedom and I would design my own language, invent keywords and whatnot? So I thought it would sound like, well, there, there must be some type that represents there's an invalid input going on. And then I'd say, well, A2I returns. If there's an or there, you see? It's some sort of an, an option. You know, it's kind of, well, it's either an int or it's an invalid input, right? But, but this is not C++, right? I mean, I don't need to tell you, right? It's uh, this is kind of, uh, I have a dream, right? So then we have, uh, we invent a keyword because we can, type switch, and depending on the result of A2I, we're going to say, well, if it was an int, I'm going to handle the happy case, and if it was an invalid input error, I'm going to handle the unhappy case. And some languages do quite that, actually, right? So that's a nice thing. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, there is something, there is a rub here, however. These two types are not um, symmetric. They don't, like, you know, here it looks like, well, it's an interim invalid input, and it looks like the branches have equal weight. See what I'm saying? The rhetorical question, I know, because it's like, I, again, I can't see nothing, right? So um, rhetorical, see what I'm saying. So it's either an int or this guy, but they have sort of equal roles, except the int comes forth, uh, first. But what I'm looking for is some sort of, I'm expecting it, so it's a probability thing almost, friends, right? Well, I expect an int, or I don't expect a, a punch in the face, right? 
I don't expect there, right? It's something rare, statistically speaking, and you know, kind of correctness, whatever speaking. So that would be uh, that would convey the fact that these two uh, these two types uh, have an a built in asymmetry as far as the function h y is concerned. Right, right. Thank you, thank you. I hear, I heard the yes. Thank you. So local code should just simply just flow through it and go with the happy case. Just, you know, I'm gonna just go happy case and if anything bad happens, I'll, you know, you type system, please take care of me. Right? That would be the socialist type system, as it were, right? It takes care of you if you do something wrong, no problem. Right? I told you I'm gonna do a political joke, okay. So, great. So now we have uh, a function that has like uh, an over return type and one or more cover return types because many things could go wrong, but only one thing could go right as it were, right? So the question is, okay, how about those unexpected things? Where do they go? Well, you know, when you call main, there's gonna be function call and there's a stack there and very nice and you gotta return up the stack because there's no other point you can return because that's the execution, you know, that's the trace you got. You can't go to a kind of in a new place that's not on the call stack. So it's gotta be on the call stack. You see, I feel like a con man here because I'm gonna con you into like, we're gonna go, well, and we, we invented exceptions. There's no, you know, there's no output. There's no chance we don't do that, right? But let me, let me con you, right? So, well, there's gotta be a return for the, these unexpected things. And certainly there must be some, uh, you know, some handlers placed somewhere on the invocation stack that are going to take care of these unexpected things. Right? Thank you for the yes, and thank you for the yes. I heard no, no. So now, the, the callers must, must plan some handling spots in the execution path, and we, you know, the cover returns kind of jump automatically to those handling spots, and guess what, we just invented exceptions, friends. Thundering applause right now, but you know, let's keep that. Because you know that was happening like 30 years ago, right? So awesome. We just we just you know by essential we didn't invent much as much as acknowledge situation, and the situation leads you to the thing. Well, you got to put some handlers on the call stack because the call stack is all you got in terms of flow, right? I mean you got to go somewhere on the call stack, and therefore you have all these tries and catches that planned uh, exception handlers. So well. Let's see uh, how exceptions go as far as uh, respecting our desires. Well, they have, there's a lot of blue. There's a lot of blue, they're pretty general. Um, well, there's a question mark there, we're gonna discuss a bit more about that. But they do centralized handling awesomely. You put in main, you put a try, you put a catch, you catch everybody's scenes right there. You're good, right? Don't forget to catch by reference. So then you have, uh, you know, you have arbitrary amount of error information. You can put anything in an exception if you wish, no problem at all. There's little cost on the normal path. Eh, we can talk about that more. Um, but they don't do local handling very well. Like if I want, like, call a function and get the error, whatever, I got to write like five lines of code, which is ridiculous. Right? Agreed? I, that's kind of the, the poor case the poor scenario which, well, I gotta try this right now and uh, do a try and catch. It's a very heavy syntax, uh, syntax for achieving a simple thing. And uh, as far as making correct code you know, easy to write, it depends quite literally on the year you ask in. Right, so, you know, skipping back to 98. Yay, we got exceptions and they are blue too. This is amazing, they syntax color. Try, catch, all that stuff, throw. It's all blue. But you know, there's the Tom Cargill article, I'm sure uh, those of you who can, you know, who have the age can uh, remember it. And there's like a lot of churn about uh, what's going on with exceptions and there's like, you know, difficulties with uh, the simplest uh, transactional uh, code. So um, 2008 was kind of the dark age of exceptions, if you wish, in C++. I think that's what the market failed. Quite, it's, I think there, there must have been some causation there. And uh, uh, nowadays, it's, uh, there's a big maybe. 
Because, you know, as uh, Charlie Bay, um, a famous boost contributor, mentioned in a report on uh, boost error, uh, he said error handling idioms and practice do remain contentious and confusing within the community. There's no one way that everybody likes and recommends, right? So, well, today we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna introduce one more means of handling errors, <laughs> as if they're not enough. You know the joke with the standards? I like about standards that there's so many to choose from. <laughs> Same about error handling in C++. You know, we have like, uh, we have uh, error codes, we have Erno, we have exceptions, we have Herb's proposal, which is pretty much uh, an except, uh, kind of, it's a special value thread that's through automatically. And you're in the room that's going to change history right now, friends. <laughs> so this is what's gonna happen right now. So let's recap what uh, issues we have with exceptions. We have uh, this whole meta-stable state, which is, I like fancy words, and this is, uh, this is my sin here, I'm saying meta-stable, and all that stuff is like an application that went like off the rails, my friends, right? It's just, oh my God, nobody knows what's gonna happen next, as I'm sure you know. Um, user must ensure the transaction semantics by hand, and uh, we have the, you know, we have destructors, we have scope guard as possible solutions, um, we have uh, the whole local error handling uh, issue which is unpleasant and inefficient. Uh, by the way, uh, let me like, make a quick parenthesis right now. You should know that just enable exceptions in your project is going to make it slower, even if you don't use exceptions. Thank you for the nod, Andre. No, that, there's a guy, Andre, it's not. There's actually a person called Andre who's, who's nodding, yes. Uh, I, I do see the first row, I, I gotta confess. So the thing is, um, with exceptions enabled, the compiler must generate the entry and exit sequence for each function a bit differently and more you know, bulky, it's more bulky. So it can, we've seen at Facebook, I remember, we've seen things like, well, 7%. And 7% could be like quite a lot of power, right? So not nice. And people have measured, like it's, it could be like 2%, it could be like unmeasurable, but it could be, uh, you know, quite a few percent. Um, so, you know, when they say like uh, zero overhead exception handling, right, that's not really zero. It's a floating point number, it's just kind of, you know, just a <laughs> bit more than zero, right? So, um, anyway, uh, parenthesis closed. So now, you know, the whole exceptions and Herb Sutter has these famous examples with like a five line function that can, could throw like five million exceptions, you know, from five million different paths and all that, uh, all that good stuff. So it's kind of a, a difficult proposition right now. And the, the least nice of all is that composition with exceptions is tenuous. It's really like bad to, well, I have two exceptions and I want to collect them in a vector of exceptions and you can't. Only one exception can be active at any moment but you know I'm lying, right? Because more than one exception can be in flight if you throw within a catch handler because the exception is not handled unless, you know, until the catch is done. So if you have like a catch and inside you call a function and it has another exception and stuff, there's several exceptions active. And that led to things like, un you know, unquote exceptions as opposed to the useless unquote exception, right? Right? Raise your hand. All right, all right, thank you. Uncaught exceptions. So, you know, that leads, uh, leads us to, uh, welcome to my talk. <laughs> we're just starting right now. So uh, we're going to do, with exceptions, we're going to do local handling, we're going to do minimize uh, soft errors, and we're going to do uh, improvements on uh, making correct code uh, easy to write. Uh, but we must start with a few background items. And background item number one is my Wikipedia page. Yes, I have a Wikipedia page. And I have more United miles than you, that you have. But I don't fly United anymore, by the way. It's just, they, they punch in the face, right? So <laughs> I don't want that, right? So I quit. Um, so uh, I was visiting my Wikipedia page, which I never contribute to, I just let other people kind of destroy me. 
So I was watching, uh, there's this uh, change at some point. Uh, I really, I literally visit like every year a couple of times that I don't follow. But anyway, at some point, there was somebody who deleted all I've done. And what they did was they added something. And it was, Andre is uh, credited with uh, creating the expected type for C++, which is being standardized. And I was like, huh, I should check that out. <laughs> Honest to God, I had no idea. So what really happened was, like back in the day, a few years ago, I had this uh, idea, which uh, I, I gave a talk about at uh, C++ and Beyond seminar. And uh, a couple of guys uh, thought, oh, that's pretty cool, so let's uh, standardize that. So um, the rest, as they say, is, uh, is history. The second background piece <coughs> would be std variant, or boost variant, which is um, the perfect implementation engine for remember, we had the overt and the covert type. We have the expected and the unexpected. It seems like they could live in a variant. Agreed? Right, it looks like this like, variant is the perfect uh, place to store such a thing, which can be one of two things, but not, never simultaneously, right? So now we have uh, uh, kind of something that's really close to what we need, which is std optional, which is either something or nothing. But we don't, we don't want something or nothing, we want something or something else, which would be the exception. So it's close, but just you know related, but not re really it. And you can go to other languages, and there's the maybe either monads, which also are nearly there, but not quite yet. Not quite there, right? So um, everything of this, uh, all of this is for us to anchor in our mind the devices that we're going to use for implementing this. There's one more, uh, which is also like uh, funny, uh, kind of very related. Uh, promise and future in C++, yes? Promise and future are mechanisms for transporting things and exceptions and whatnot from one thread to another. So they focus on the threading aspect. And again, they're very close to what we need. So I'm not gonna insist too much on this uh, union types and, uh, and stuff, uh, it's, but it's, uh, it's kind of valuable for, uh, for illustration. So uh, we're going to have a discriminated union type, which is pretty much uh, one of, of two types, uh, T or U, and we have the class either, let's call it, and the union is going to store one or the other and the Boolean. The Boolean, sadly, is going to cost us an, a whole word because of alignment, right? So it's going to be like uh, the maximum of T and U plus alignment plus the Boolean and that kind of stuff. Fine. So let's define a type std expected, which takes a T and an E. And the T is the expected type, and the E, well, it should have been like E and U. Yeah, should like E expected, U unexpected, but it's T and E, sorry. So, you know, whatever. You're smart, I mean, you're the best in the world, right? What, I, so T would be the expected type and E would be the error, you know, the unexpected type, which is um, kind of the bad guy in the story. And we want to express this union of the overt and uh, covert type. And in the nice, happy case, there's a valid T in there, and in the unhappy case, an E is there explaining why T could not exist. I kind of, I think it's neat, really. I, this, if at this point you think it's not neat, please go to other, another talk. You know, you're gonna hate the rest. So it's either a T or, honey, I can explain. <laughs> yes, I can explain. Why the T could not be produced? See the proposal by Vicente, and oh, you know what J stands for? It's Jean-Francois, but nobody can pronounce his name. So he said, I'm gonna just call myself JF, stupid American. <laughs> I can make fun. I can make fun of Americans and Europeans. I have double citizenship. <laughs> I have Romanian citizenship, which according at least to some sources is Europe. And I have American citizens, I'm good, I can criticize. I, I'm, I'm a one-eighth Greek, I can criticize Greeks. They have big nose, right? <laughs> I have no mercy, uh, equal opportunity offender, okay? So don't, get, don't come near me, okay? So uh, these folks took my idea and they actually went through the ordeal of making it to a proposal. And the proposal is making nice progress, so I'm going to discuss it. 
Uh, by the way, Jean-Francois, please stand up. Uh, he's, of course, he's in the last seat in the back. <laughs> of course. And I told him I'm going to stand him up. Thank you very much. Give him a hand, please. Thank you. All right, so he got the aura, the light on his head. It was like a mystical event. So um, uh, their proposal goes as follows. So we want to unify the local, the local and centralizer handling by the following means. You're going to return an std expected of, for example, int and some error type. And that would be the result of, let's say, A2I++, right? So if you're on local, you're going to look, well, result has value or not. So you get, there's going to be a Boolean if, uh, that tells you whether it has a value or not. And the simplest idiom that you can use for local error handling is if result use star result, right? And that would mean even though it's not a pointer, the expected object behaves like a pointer. <clears throat> you can test it with if, and you can actually dereference it. You can use the arrow, and so it, it's kind of a pseudo pointer, if you wish. Now, uh, if you want uh, centralized, you just use result.value. There's a mistake on the slide. You should use result.value. Because in its infinite wisdom, the standardization committee said, if somebody is going to use star result and the value is not happy, undefined behavior. Because apparently there's not enough of it in the C++ language. I'm hearing some laughter. It's not, it's not the laughter that I was hoping for. It's like, ha, 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 yeah, I know, but I'm going to kill you after this. <laughs> because there's many committee members in this room, and there's many, many, uh, you know, many folks who uh, are pro the committee members. So let me criticize. There is enough undefined behavior in C++, and should not have done that. You feel the tension? <laughs> it's, that's like really nobody seeing. All right, so anyway, <clears throat> essentially it's like this. If you say result.value, it's going to throw the exception if it's not good. If you say start the result, undefined behavior, which actually Jean-Francois was very smart to say, you know what, if it's undefined, a good implementation may as well throw the damn E. <laughs> right, and it's all good in the world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, oh, okay, this is awesome. I got some golf, golf clap. Oh, yeah, okay, that was, okay. <laughs> Thank you, good. So, um, well, let's look at uh, some characteristics of expected e, and we're gonna actually go a bit into the implementation. So it associates, this is the most beautiful thing, because it's like in locking, it's good to associate the, the mutex with the data it's protecting and that kind of stuff. So this sort of encapsulation is very, um, historically, it's very uh, productive and very kind of good, like you know, motherhood, ap apple pie. So it associates the errors, the computational goal that I want to produce with whatever errors may be created in the process of attempting that production. So they're encapsulated together in this expected thing, which is beautiful. I like it. Um, it naturally allows multiple exceptions because the exception is produced but not thrown. This is really the key to understanding this, this whole idiom, which is, wait a second, I'm actually creating the exception with the constructor and whatever, so the exception exists, but it is not yet thrown. It's created now, thrown later, if at all. So you can actually do error handling with exceptions without throwing exceptions. That would have been actually a great moment for the golf clap that was before, but you know, anyway. So this is the awesomeness of it. You can actually, uh, yeah, so now we have, we can have a million exceptions if we wanted. We could have a vector of exceptions. We could have an STD uh, map of uh, mapping strings to accept whatever you want, right? And then, you know, you can transport them across threads, no throw, whatever, across time, save, save it now, throw it later, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Collect group, combine exceptions. Actually compose programs that use exceptions because you can't compose by throwing. You can't build by destroying. It's basic, right? It's basic, uh, I don't know what, right? Okay, so let's look at the implementation. <clears throat> so I have, uh, as expected, <laughs> okay, that was an unintended pun. 
Uh, we have a template with two arguments, T and E, and we have a union containing a T and an E, uh, yay and nay, and we have a Boolean OK, which we initialize the optimistic way. We go with the notion that by default, the expected is going to happen. I mean, even the vocabulary goes that way. Very nice. Uh, the default constructor is going to create a default initialized T because T is expected, friends. Thank you very much, right? Of course. Uh, there's been actually debate about this. A default constructor is expected, said the pessimistic people. Uh, I'm not sure if it should contain a T because I didn't tell it to create a T. Ta -da -da. And now we have um, uh, the constructor that takes a const T, of course, is going to copy the T into the thing. But now there's the third constructor here, which, what the, ah, okay, I pressed the wrong button, okay. Uh, so I have the third constructor here, which is expected, and it takes a const unexpected of V uh, reference RHS. Where did that unexpected come from, and what is it doing? Any, I, if you have an idea, you can raise your hand. I'm not gonna call you out, but raise your hand if you have an idea why that could be the case. Why do I need a wrapper around the E type that's called unexpected? I see a couple of hands, awesome. Okay, I have news for everybody else, here's why. Because you should be able to have a template that is, has a, you expect an int, but the error code is also int. I mean, int is a very, like, it's a classic error code return, result. So I could have an, I expect an int, but the error code is also an int. So then I need to distinguish between the constructor of the happy case and the constructor of the unhappy case. So I'm going to wrap that int into a completely unremarkable type, which is called unexpected. But wait, you ask. What if I want to expect the unexpected? That's where the paragraph comes and says, you can't expect the unexpected. That's illegal use. Done. By law, it's forbidden. So that's very nice. They thought of everything. But you got to have that unexpected type. It's completely unremarkable. It just wraps a type, and it has like, give me that thing, and that's the only interface it has. It's important just to tag the value of uh, E, uh, the type of E. All right, uh, anything more interesting here? Let's take a look. Uh, we have the move constructor and everything with, uh, with uh, the um, universal reference here. I said universal, not forward. I'm not gonna comment anymore about that. Uh, we have Kind of, uh, it's getting more interesting by, by each slide. So we, are, we kind of have, okay, so let's copy this thing, and if okay, I'm going to copy that thing, and otherwise I'm going to copy the other thing. Um, I have the move constructor, which is along the same lines. And here's the disaster scenario. Yes, I put in a comment. If you're a good person, you uncomment that line. Yes, please. Please come on that line. Oh, by the way, the argument was efficiency. So apparently all that work on branch prediction, all that good stuff is not, not good enough. Anyhow, so we have like a, a number of overloads and all the jazz. I think actually in the real, in, in, uh, Jean-Francois implementation is like eight of them, uh, quite a few. And we have the operate, the dereference operator and we have give me the error, please. So that would be, um, I'm fetching the error. And again, I think it has undefined behavior if uh, there's no error there. And um, I have a query which tells me, well, do you have a value or not? And it's going to simply return whether the value is happy. We have the bool operator which allows us the if test. And we have the value, give me the value, and this actually does throw the exception if it's, uh, it's good. So, you know, value is the right thing to do. Agreed? Uh, now, there's, uh, there will be a, a side discussion that I would like to have. 
which is what's the deal with uh, exception? It's not a pointer, but it looks, you know, it acts like a pointer. It has the star, it has the arrow, and it has the pointer-like characteristics. There is a precedent to that, which is called loud. No, there should be like a choir here. Optional. Optional behaves like a, not, looks like a pointer. It behaves, it's actually an optional value, but it looks like a pointer in the sense that you can put star on it, you can put arrow on it, and you can achieve undefined behavior as much as you want. <laughs> There's like any, not, any amount of undefined behavior you can get from optional. And uh, it's a precedent. There was no other type in the standard library that would look like a pointer but not be a pointer. And it's kind of, I would say it's an unproven design. I would say it's, uh, the jury is still out on that one. But, the, you know, it was already standardized and it was there. So they said, we already made a couple of bad decisions there. How about we port them to expected as well? This is the true story. The option was like the perfect legal uh, uh, precedent that they say, oh, well, we have all of these bad things here, all of these awful things we're doing here. Oh, you have this proposal, please do this thing in expected as well, and we're gonna accept it. By the way, you have the power to protest. This is not approved yet. It's not probably after this talk, is never gonna. <laughs> so. But you can actually, you can actually, you know, uh, call your local representative <laughs> and uh, tell them, you know, I, I would like some more defined behavior if possible. Uh, I'm hearing something, I'm gonna ignore it. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, the most interesting function I had to write, and I actually found a bug in, the, in uh, Vicentes and Jean-Francois' proposal, um, which is the swap function, which is very funny because you must swap two values that may have actual different types because one might be uh, bad and one might be good. So let's go with uh, looking at swap. I'm going to skip the signature for now, friends. So I'm going to go, see, this is like a long enable if t with uh, a complex, you know, sim quite complex Boolean condition here. But let's ignore that for a moment. And let's uh, handle the easy cases. Let's handle the easy cases. The easiest case is uh, both are good. If okay and the right is okay, then there's two good values and we're going to swap the yes. With me? Thank you. So uh, if, if uh, one is, <laughs> this is kind of, a, uh, I'm, I'm, this is kind of a, um, I'm simplifying my life here because here I say, oh, I'm gonna do this later. Yeah, I'm swapping the swap piece. I'm saying I'm gonna solve this later, you know, in the sales case, it means the first is good and the, the second is bad. I'm going to say, oh, let me handle it later so I don't duplicate code. Um, then, uh, if my, uh, me, this is not okay, and RH is not okay, again, I just swap the nays. So that's again easy. And else, here comes dragons. This is the difficult part. The dot, dot, dot here is the difficult part. Because I need to swap I know that um, one object is a T and the other object is an E and I need to swap them really carefully. And it look, it's like two drivers, two cars driving, you know, 100 kilometers, sorry, 60 miles an hour and they need to kind of jump each other and you know, there's two different drivers in two different cars. It's a difficult proposition. So let's take a look. And kind of, you know, it takes you a bit of like, a, you gotta think of it a bit. It's not easy. So what I did was, well, let me actually create a temporary I'm going to move from my nay. I'm bad, the other guy's good, right? So I'm going to move away from nay, so I free up my object, this. The next thing I'm going to do is, careful here, I still need to call the destructor of nay. Even after a move, you still have the civic duty to call the destructor for absolutely no reason, because nobody's gonna be out of their mind to leave something interesting that needs to be destroyed carefully. But you don't know that. So you're being politically correct here, you're going to call the destructor. After move, the object in a, is in a destroyable state, et cetera, et cetera, yada, 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 correct? Okay, now we gotta destroy that guy, so at this, po at this point, this, my object, is empty and ready to receive new content. 
What we're going to do now, fine, I'm going to put true in OK, so I'm going to make it a good object, right? And I'm going to, uh, sorry, before OK, I'm going to trans transfer the content of the good object from RHS into this by means of a move constructor and the placement new. I'm, I'm sure I'm being followed here, but I'm talking a vacuum. So please give me a, like a yes. Okay, Jean-Francois didn't say it. I, he I heard you not saying. So now I'm going to, after the, the move construction has succeeded, then I can safely just set the, the flag to true. And at this point, right after OK equals true, this is in a good state. It has the final state that I'm looking for. After that, I'm going to say, well, uh, let me uh, go on the other side, and at this point, RHS is, uh, you know, it's, it's ready to receive the new thing, so I'm going to call uh, the T destructor, as I said, we gotta do that, because that's a nice thing to do. And then we're going to uh, initialize it from, by moving from T, the temporary we just had on the stack. And at the last, uh, as the last, uh, the last act here, we're going to set the flag to false. And at this point, the swap is done. Now, you know, you gotta figure that if any of these throws an exception, not good. It gets pretty tense, right? Therefore, getting back to the signature, which I think that this is the bug I found, the signature was not restrictive enough. So you know, you can't really do whatever you want. So uh, enable if T is um, enabling the function to exist if and only if T is move constructible and swappable and E is move constructible and swappable. All of these conditions must be met, hence the, the conjunction, and otherwise there's no swap. You can't define it. This is my, this is my uh, it's, not, it's not impossible. Somebody may find a kind of a number of methods and tricks and uh, kind of careful copy and move combinations that are gonna work better, but this is uh, the best I could, could get. So again, it's a, it's a very good homework for you all to consider uh, looking at. Uh, so now, you know, we have the, we have the abstraction, very nice, so typical use, you go expect a double runtime error, good, and the search star good is 100, it all goes through, although nobody should compare double numbers by equality. You know, it's funny, like, when, whenever you give a tech talk, you gotta qualify pretty much every single statement you, you give, you say, because uh, there's all these complications. Um, unexpected, this and big is the bad case, so we have the expected, we construct it with an unexpected of runtime error, uh, so Jean-Francois and uh, Vicente did a very nice thing of uh, having this unexpected thing be uh, at the same time a functional type, which is clever. So it's simply just uh, call unexpected here without any type or anything, it just works. That's beautiful. Very nice and easy to use. And there's actually, there's uh, some details in Flux here about uh, that particular bit. Uh, typical use, let's uh, imagine we define a relative uh, function that takes two doubles and returns the relative uh, ratio of B to A, and you, uh, you know, if one is zero, you can't divide by zero, you're going to return an unexpected, and otherwise you simply rely on the default construction of expected and return a double, you're done. Very nice. Um, centralizer handling goes, well, um, if you like undefined behavior, use operator star. If you don't, use that value. And that's, that's pretty much the extent of my fury here because I'm, I'm so like uh, indignated that I'm, I'm gonna actually act calm right now. Uh, is thrown if uh, you call value against a dud and uh, that kind of stuff. So by the way, this is, has undefined behavior, so don't do this. Use relative ta -da -da dot value, right? Local handling is easy, you just say if not R, we have the error and we know what to do. And of course, expect a bit more cost because there's an extra test involved, but uh, it's all good. Question for everybody. You know, once I walked into a forest and the tree fell, I didn't hear it. What happens if you have, if you call a function, it fails to produce the result, it returns an actual exception, 
but you never look at the result. So essentially, expect that is a contract that says it's either a T or an explanation for the failure of producing said T. Agreed? You're with me. Now, I call a function, gives me an expected, and it turns out I don't need it. Well, if I don't need it, I don't care if it could not be produced. This is the gist of lazy evaluation. It's beautiful. Well, there's been some discussion about it. Apparently, some people said, no, nah, actually, you can't. You gotta, like, there's an error that goes unchecked. And you know, they have an argument. I, I agree. They do have an argument. It's just completely wrong. <laughs> and by the way, in LLVM, you're going to find something like that, which has a different name, but it's kind of along the same lines. And actually, in the destructor, if you didn't check the thing, it's going to, no, it's not going to throw. They know more than that. They know better than that. It's going to abort the whole application. <laughs> the tree, not only it was audible, it was an atomic explosion, OK? <laughs> no, not, I'm not kidding. This is like true, truth. I saw it like just five minutes before my talk. Anyhow, to uh, wrap up, we associate with expected errors with the goals of computation. And I think that's wonderful. We naturally allow as many exceptions as you want, no problem. You can teleport across threads, uh, you name it, stacks, you, whatever you want. You just can uh, transport exceptions just like normal values. You don't need to throw them. Um, you can uh, save them now, throw them later. You can do whatever you want with classic composition me uh, measures that uh, C++ gives you. You can collect, group, and combine them. And they're much, so much simpler for a compiler to optimize because it's simple if and else tests. You've been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Um, with exceptions, if a function can throw an exception E1, and another function invokes that function, and can also throw an exception E2, then the total set of exceptions that can be thrown by the second function are E1 and E2. Um, how do you represent and compose errors with this type in general? Um, uh, this is very interesting. So how do you compose with, um, uh, you have functions that may throw different types of exceptions, and how do you compose with it given that expected that is only one type? Uh, actually, the initial design was more generous in that regard. It allowed more composition. Um, but the current design does not, I, I sort of, the, the design, like my baby would have uh, had like any exception, would have supported any exception. Um, that said, I noticed that the world is moving from uh, large exception hierarchies to smaller exception hierarchies. And there's a, there's a bit of a trend in the community to say, you know what, we really don't need those, those many exception classes because we do one thing with all them all. We just print the error and we say, have a good day. <laughs> so it's not, you know, I don't think it's a critical issue, but I agree it is an issue. It's difficult to compose if you have like multiple ex exception types. Yes, please. If a function has side effects uh, and it, it's returning an expected and it successfully generates the expected or maybe it doesn't get to it yet because one of the side effects fails, what, what then? Yeah, that brings us to, so, you know, the function has side effects. It also produces a value, but you get like, you know, don't check the error. So there is a bit of a fuzzy area there, right? That's the gist of, well, uh, I, should, uh, I should add, there is a thing as an expected void, which is interesting because I expect nothing. It's only run for the, uh, for the side effects of the function. Uh, if a function has a side effect, then this is kind of an imperfect scenario. But you know, this is C++. Imperfect scenarios are the name of the game. You can't, you can't have everything. I agree there's a fuzzy error there. Where are the side effects? Where is the return value? It applies best to functional style scenarios. Thank you. So you observed that it doesn't really make sense to uh, complain if the, uh, the expected object is destroyed without being accessed uh, because you didn't need the value, so you don't care if it <coughs> failed. Uh, so what about expected void? Yeah, so expected void would be that one case in which it's um, 
painfully clear that I'm running the function just for its side defects, so then the, something must be said about that error. I agree. Yeah, expected void would be the one case in which, eh, you got to the destructor, didn't check anything, it's expected void. There must be some, there must be some boom there. I agree. Thank you. That's Thanks. a great point. Thank you. Hey, so uh, during your talk you mentioned, um, you know, exceptions having a performance cost, which uh, I don't, I really like that in the ether because it's just sort of compared to what? It's very nonspecific. So I'm just curious, in, in these cases where you looked at it, I assume you compared to something. So was it a case where an exception was being used for error handling in a local scope? And did you look <coughs> at, do you think that results would generalize in, you know, the situations where exceptions really shine is if you're throwing, let's say, an exception up five call stack layers. Now getting rid of an exception means adding branches at every single layer of the call stack. I mean, I'm skeptical that exceptions will be slower in the normal path than error codes in that case. I think uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think I understand the point. So uh, the point is, well, how did you, what's your baseline when you evaluate? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, the baseline was the same application written with uh, error codes and the enable exceptions. So you pay all the costs, but you don't reap the benefits. So that, you see, that, that, make, that makes it a bit unfair to exceptions. I, I agree with that. The ideal test would be you write the whole application using one style, you write the whole application using the other style and you compare. Uh, that would be difficult. I, we didn't run such a, such a test. Thank you. Um, one of my issues with exceptions historically has been it's difficult when you're trying to log where errors happened, where exactly the error happened if you're catching it some level up the call stack. Um, it seems like with rich composition, with this sort of methodology, it would be possible to inject, you know, with relatively low programmer <coughs> overhead, something that would facilitate being able to log an effective stack trace of where your error happened, even if you're catching it three or four levels up. Um, is that something that's been given consideration in the design as, uh, an optional way to enable, or you know, is would that be roll your own if you wanted to enable that sort of functionality? Okay, so um, let me make sure I understand. The question is like with uh, with a try catch approach, it's sort of more esoteric to on the way up to kind of print things, log things. Well, this happened. More specifically, if you want to get the global error handling at a higher level of the stack, you're giving up the specificity of exactly where the exception right. is from. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, with expect that this is, uh, this is pretty much um, a typical scenario in which you do have that chance uh, with normal programming means as opposed to kind of esoteric stack traces and stuff. So um, I don't, it was not a consideration, but it's a great, it's a great angle that you have uh, about that because I think it makes it like painfully easy to just simply, whenever you, you, you feel you're gonna, you're gonna be able to insert instrumentation to say, well, this something bad has happened here. And I'm going to uh, continue moving upwards. Thank you. Andre. If you want to force the person to deal with the accepted, can you just mark it as a no discard? No discard. Um, <clears throat> there are some, um, yeah, I think you could do that. Uh, GCC has that, right? Uh, th there's an annotation that uh, today, <laughs> there is an annotation that says no discard or discard and that kind of stuff, right? Yep. So are you talking about like competition with that feature? No, I'm saying if you were worried about if you return a temporary expected, it would just disappear if you cared about the side effects. Ah, okay. Could you force them to deal with the side effects okay, by so making it no discard. Okay, so the corollary of that would be expected void would always be no discard. Is that along the well, same? If you mark it as no discard, so you, they have to ask it, which would cause it to throw. Okay, this is it. So we should chat more about this right, right now. Uh, we're out of time here, so oh, uh, no more lunch for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.